It's well. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, today, we're in the office of the attorney, Margaret W. Wong and Associates in the office in Atlanta, in the city of Atlanta. And we are so happy to have her. How are you doing, Ms. Wong? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for traveling to um, to Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> we are thinking, and what the, city is yeah. this? Yes. Yeah, no, no, no. Today we are in Atlanta, but we know that you were in North Carolina for a few days. So how is everything going in different states in the United States of America? It's actually doing very well now that there's not as much deportation or removal. So now most of the cases we see that stuck in jail or detained in prison or in jail mostly already have criminal records. That's why I really advise uh, people in America, if you have criminal records, if you have like the old removal or deportation, or you have left and come back, left and come back, get your foyer. So at least when something bad happened, your lawyer, yeah, I don't know what happened. And we don't know what, and to know your enemies, you have to be prepared, you know, any yes. day when they come. That's true. And of course, that we need to talk to an attorney that has experience. So, Ms. Wong, what is the difference now with um, those cases that are filing asylum, um, and defensive asylum? Because some people are getting their asylum applications rejected, uh -huh. and they say that they can file again and that they can do affirmative asylum. Right, because there are four ways to get out of a court system. You either get a dismissal, that's a new law that started two or three years ago. You either get termination or you do a status. That means case is still in court, but it's a status, mm -hmm. or you can admin close. That means you close the case, but case is still in court. So for the asylum and, and for it to be, if it's an admin close, or uh, status, you don't really need to refile, you protect the work permit. But for cases that's dismissed or terminated, you could actually do a new filing. The question is, do you want to? Because you don't want another NTA and go back to court. But on the other hand, it's okay if you're desperate for that work permit, just make sure you have a meritorious claim and not a frivolous filing. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Wong, for this experience. case so um Aww. when i come through the border for the immigration officers to let me in uh to this country i need to tell them a story that is a credible fear story that they have to believe that it, it's gonna be a real story so why uh, or what is a good story so that they can let me in to the united states Right. So it's difficult because each country have their problems, like El Salvador now is probably one of the safest countries now in all of Latin America because 
press putting everybody in jail. Everybody in tattoo go to jail. Everybody whose son have tattoo go to jail. So right now the people are sort of revolting against that. So it really depends on the country condition, but it's hard really to come because these people are experienced at the border. They know when we tell the truth. I mean, there's always a line that is a lie, but they do know. So my recommendation is always try to do CPP1. CPP1 is a very new program. They actually started when um, uh, Obama was here, but it's, at that time it's not called CPP1, but now it's called CPP1. It started a few months ago. So if you're willing just to go on the border and wait around, the kiosk there, and uh, President Biden is talking about having 200 kiosks now in Mexico and Latino countries with these kiosks, so you can punch a number in. And that's different from tourist visa, because when you apply for the tourist visa, you have to go to the usdos.gov, fill in the DS-160, and, and there it's always better not to have relatives in America, because the more relatives you have in America, the more ties you have in America, which is not good to get tourist visa. But CPP-1 is the opposite, the CAM program, the family reunification program for the, for the Haitians and the Cubans and the Venezuelans. Those are all for people who have more family here, the better. So CPP-1 really is doing very well. Now I've seen quite a few people coming in from Mexico from CPP-1 because Mexico does not have family reunification program and does not have that Afghanistan and the Ukrainian program. But CPP-1 is working. So try to have your relative not come in undocumented or come up with a, with a you know, uh, chicken speed uh, story, but wait for CPP-1. We have already seen clients coming and it's really worth the wait because you get a two-year work permit. You also come legally so you won't be hurt on the way and you know people take advantage of people like us and stuff like that. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong, for this uh, comment and this answer. And don't forget that if you need to talk to the attorney, Margaret W. Wong and Associates, um, you can call the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, attorney Margaret W. Wong and Associates, they have all... Um, all the experience that you need over 46 years working on the immigration field, helping families and helping everybody who has uh, contacted them or called them to uh, start a case and get an immigration relief. So don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Um, Ms. Wong, uh, so I have a question. Is a lady from Mexico and she says, my daughter is with her uh, son and her husband. And they are coming to the United States. They are in Puebla, Mexico, and they are filing for asylum. Uh, she wants to surrender to immigration. Uh, how could it be affected or how could she be affected? She wants to apply for asylum at the border. Okay, exactly. That's when you come through the border because in olden days we pay 6,000, 8,000, you know, they would swim us across the river and you have to walk four days, five days, 10 days. Now you just cross the border and you'll say, I want asylum. That's the old way. The new way, as I said earlier, is CBP-1 now. So see if they have kiosks around different cities, I, because I don't know, because I'm not at the border now, because these things change every day. Mm -hmm. I do recommend you file for the CBP-1, especially if you have relatives in America. List everybody. It's not going to hurt them, but it'll help you. But if you mm -hmm. want, then you exactly... Then you need a story, apply at the border and see if they let you in. I've also seen clients who spent maybe three or four days in jail in um, at the border and then went into a steward, which is Atlanta jail, and then went into Virginia jail and then let out in New York. Who knows? Because I've seen people in jail for four months and let out. People stay six months and let out. Um, but those were before the CPP ones. So I really think they're trying to get people orderly to come in legally and give us work permit 
Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong, for that answer. And thank you so much for texting us and sending us the questions that we are getting right now for the attorney, Margaret W. Wong. Let's go to our inbox because we have a lot of questions coming in. And uh, one of the persons that uh, has been uh, sending us questions uh, says, Hi, attorney. Um, I have a question. I have been... Uh, trying to come to the United States on a tourist visa, but they have denied me the tourist visa because I am from India. Um, what is a good way to enter? I have family that have businesses in the United States, and I would like to know if I can, if they can apply for me. One way to do it is become a Mexican or Canadian citizen. Cana Most Chinese are doing it now. Either go to Canada, because Canada, you've got citizenship in three years. Once you get a Canadian citizenship in Mexico, the Chinese are doing it because it's cheaper in Mexico than Canada. Get the Mexican or Canadian citizen. Now you come to America on an E2 visa, which means that you can come to America on the on the investment visa. So basically, the India, the reason why India and China is a big problem is because people born in India it takes about 10, 12 years to get an EB3, EB2 green card. And people born in China it takes five to six years. So how do you get it faster? It's really by the investment, the EB5. Uh, so now you see a lot of India, China, China people, not the Hong Kong, but more the China. Uh, the Instead of waiting for 10, 12 years, five, six years, they're coming on EB-5. So now the quota again is stuck. But you get, so non-immigrant visa comes from whatever nationality. So it became Canadian or Mexican or anybody who has a um, e-visa, you can always Get the passport. That's why a lot of countries are selling passport. Like there was a time that um, um, Costa Rica, you can buy a passport for thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars. So some countries you can do it. Um, some like Virgin Islands or something. But now that's gone because America don't like that. Because once you get their passports, you can use the American embassy there to come to America on whatever visa that country person have. So a lot of these countries are like Korea, they have e visa, Japan they have e-visas but india china we have no e-visa on the other hand to get the green card you need the country of birth not the country of nationality so okay right see that's the problem that's why the indians not only the question is how do i come to answer your question if you cannot come on a tourist visa maybe try the student visa but it's also hard now to come on a student visa. And also be careful because I have clients who try to come on a tourist visa denied two or three times, then apply for the student visa denied two or three times. Now they came undocumented through Mexico or through Canada. Actually, now it's easier to come through Mexico illegally than Canada because Canada and America just signed a new treaty. So now they come to America illegally. America now is smart enough to go through the U.S. Department of State, years ago, they don't do that. Now they do. They look at this person's profile and say, hey, when you apply for the tourist visa, you applied for the student visa, you said you were single and no children. How come now suddenly at the border, now you say you're married and you lose your wife, you know? So they do check it. So whoever filed tourist visa or student visa was denied and came to America illegally, I would be very careful what you had said. We also have other Indian clients who went to England for four or five years, was a student there, and, and the refugee status was denied. Now they come to America or go to Canada, denied, come to America. We have to be careful because these Western countries, they all share intelligence because immigration now in America is homeland security. They all share intelligence. So if you tell Canadian immigration that you have a fear because you're a Sikh, now you don't want to be a Patel, and now you come up with another story because they will check what you told Canada or England or something like that. So these are all the new developments in the past few years. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. This is the phone number that you need to call to talk to the attorney, Margaret W. Wong. Mr. And Juan Carlos is so serious, and we have known each other for so long. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm super happy that you are here with us today, <laughs> and you. that you keep traveling. I've heard that uh, COVID is coming back, and some people. Well, I already got COVID again, but it I'm was sorry. very mild. 
super you. mild. So uh, the first time I got COVID, I was working in this office, and I noticed I that, that I I, yeah. I noticed that I had COVID uh, because I went to the kitchen and I couldn't smell the food. So I didn't tell nothing to Miss He or Miss uh, Florence, but I enclosed into the the little office. And I tried to smell my food. I tried to smell my coffee, my perfume. And then I was freaking out that I may have, may have had coffee. So I didn't see anybody for uh, 10 days. And then I came back and I said, well, I'm alive. I'm good. I never felt very, very bad, but it was kind of bad. I had all the symptoms. So I went to an event this year, 2023. July the 24th, and I felt bad for like three days, and I had all the COVID symptoms. Then I noticed that a bunch of people had COVID uh, after they went to that big event in Indiana and San Luis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that we got COVID, but it was not that bad mm -hmm. because we're already vaccinated. We have the first, second, the booster and everything. So we are good now. Good. So please don't stop traveling, Ms. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because we know that you stopped traveling back then in 2020. But uh, thank God you are good. You are doing good. You are healthy. And just getting focused on the work. Um, I have a question here. This person is Jennifer. She, she says, hello, I have a question. My husband and I have an opportunity for a global entry interview. Um through University of Notre Dame. My employer, uh, if we pass the application process, does his 601A waiver automatically make him in a, uh, unlegible to apply? The way i um, reading it, any admissibility, even waivers can disqualify someone. Wait. I don't think, and I don't know the answer because uh, global, I myself is not a global entry because I haven't traveled a lot overseas anymore. I don't know if global entry are for people who doesn't have papers. I think global entry are only for citizens and green card. Personally, I would not apply if I were your husband until I get my green card. The fact that your husband have a 601A means that you are a citizen of green card and he has a 601A pending. I personally would not do global entry that's my personal take on it so global entry is run also by homeland security i just don't trust them i don't like them i mean even though now i'm you know i'm a citizen but i would not do global entry if i have no papers but i don't know the answer because maybe she could but i don't want to do it because no. you don't want your name anywhere close to them until you get your green card or citizen sorry okay. thank you so yeah. much no. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. If you need more information, please just give us a call. Uh, the phone number is 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 is the phone number that you need to call in order to talk to the attorney, Margaret W. Wong. Um, the next question we have is, uh, hi, Ms. Wong. Thank you for this show. Um, I got VAWA, and now I got my green card. After a while, I was fighting for it for four years. Now I am a green card holder and uh, I got married again. I'm going to have a baby. But I would like to know if it will affect me that I could file for my husband. Absolutely no effect. So file the I-130, you have a green card. So don't even worry how you got the green card. So file the I-130 and depends on the husband's status of legal entry. When you become a citizen, he can adjust. If undocumented entry, but never left the country and come back and come back, he may need a 601A. So it's a new case for your husband. But for you, no problem, you already got it. And make sure you become a citizen in four years, nine months, and one day. And congratulations on our new baby. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Wong. Okay, now we have Lorena. Is the <clears throat> the next person? She says, um, "Hi, I was recommended to communicate with you uh, to know about the asylum process. I am from Colombia, and I would like to know if I can apply for it." 
uh, it depends on when you come to America, how old were you, why were you fleeing Colombia, did you have a tourist visa, and if so, how did you get it, how many times were you here, because I have a lot of clients, especially from Colombia, the rich people get tourist visas, because, you know, there's a 5% rich, 95% poor, so we have clients who came and left on the tourists, who came and left, and then now is after 10 years, now they apply for asylum. So what fear occurred now that, that did not occur every time you left and come back? And that could be, you know, discouraging because every time you left, you have to look back at country conditions. Maybe your cousin was murdered, maybe a drug bust or whatever, but we have to explain each time if you left and you came back, what made you decide to come back, what made you leave? And if you're that scared, why did you leave? In the meantime, did you leave just to get married? What happened to your husband? What happened to your fiance at that time? How come they didn't threaten your fiance? These are all things that's good questions. And did you report to police? If not, why not? If so, is there any future fear to the police? We have a case actually where the police already got the bad guy and the bad guy is going to sit in jail for 60 years. So what's the fear? The police already got the bad guy. He's already in jail. Why are you still fearful? So these are questions that need to be answered. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Wong. And well, sadly, Colombia is starting to go to get through what Venezuela has been for the last 24, 25 years. Um, but somehow it's their fault because Venezuelan people warned them to, to not vote for this president. And now, and they did. They and did. They listen. Yeah, right. And now they're going through the same uh, situation. I would like, I would say uh, some other words, but. Uh, I could be rude, uh, but it's, it's the truth. It is They were warned that they shouldn't vote for these people because it's the same kind of uh, political thought. But it's okay. <sighs> people need to learn in their own heads. That's a um, very sad truth that we shouldn't go. Uh, <clears throat> okay, now we have uh, Sakir Patel. And Sakir is asking... Um, how difficult is to get a student visa if I am living in India? It's not difficult. It depends on what your grade point average is. I, what's your grade point average in high school? Did you go to a private or English high school? Did you go to public high school? You know, what ranking? India is very tough on their ranking. I mean, everything is ranking. So what university, if you're coming on master's degree, what's your grade point average? Did you have a scholarship here? Do you play good chess, good soccer, cricket? So if you're good in sports, make sure you put it. It'll be nice to have a scholarship. It'll be nice if the I-20 is from a good school, especially from the famous schools, name school, that's easier. So these are things that you need to look at. And also look, bring everything in. The property is owned by, this you're probably young, you're a student, but the property is owned by your parents. Does your parents ever have a tourist visa? Did they leave and come back? And on the question, did any immigrant visa was ever filed for you? Because a lot of cases, especially from India, the grandparents, filing for the parent, the parents filing for the child. There's a lot of chain filing. So make sure if it's no, it's no, if it's yes. But if your grandparents file for your parents and you are just coming as a student, your answer is no. I, I always get questions like that. My parents are waiting for their green card through their parents, but I just want to go to school. Do I say yes or no? The answer is you say no. And also, mm -hmm. if grandparents are in America, on the day you apply, you say yes, because the question is, do you have any immediate relatives? in America, but if your grandparents already went back, even for a visit, the answer is no. That's very, very important because mm -hmm. you don't want too many people in America. If it's uncles and aunties, the answer is no because answer, uh, you don't need to answer your whole world relatives, you know, especially in our culture, we call everybody uncle. Unless it's a blood, sister, brother, parents, children, the answer is no. So <sighs> these are little things. It's not that easy to fill out that DS-160. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong. Don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. And Guyen Kim Tin <laughs> is sending us uh, little hearts in this show. So thank you so much for uh, for your love and for caring about Ms. Wong. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this... Uh, person is um, 
why is the processing very very slow at this moment this is agonic the backlog of cases takes a terrible uh, yes. toll on those waiting why is that yes everything is becoming slow nobody wants to work it's the same problem you know if you look at the wall street journal the new york times the plain dealer my local newspaper everybody's quietly quitting and companies are quietly uh, firing people just don't want to go to the office that applies to same with immigration you also and don't assume when a work permit is denied that it should be denied always read i mean that's why we're in america read it read the reason for denial we have cases that's denied it's so glaring error that even i'm laughing at what is this you know it's our government i mean how could they take out 410 dollars take 900 some dollars and deny a case when we know it should be approved always read the denial and do an appeal or do a refile depends on which is faster never trust just look at it always denied oh let me go see another lawyer you know always give your same lawyer a chance always look at that denial we just got a denial actually from another law firm that i felt so bad and that law firm is a friend of mine it's a c1 transit visa married to an american citizen the alien came about 15 years ago on a c1 but the denial clearly says c1 transit with visa because if you transit without visa of course you cannot adjust but it's a c1 transit visa of course you can adjust 45 denied and then this poor kid was like and the lawyer said no now you have to do a 601a and by luck i got the case so i called my friend and i say hey you know did you read it he said oh no my paralegal read it and i just thought oh now we have to do 601a i said no 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 read it because it's a transit case you could do it so at least now i'm happy that i think the kid will be approved okay, but these are things good. that you need to read that denial and sometimes it happens to me, we're all busy, you know, on the phone, I say, oh, read it to me. And somehow by the time they read it, another call came and, you know, things happen. Read that denial, because I've been getting a, quite a lot of wrongful denials. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wong. And we have the last question for uh, today. Our time is up, actually, but I'm going to read this last question. Uh, this person says that he filed for a work permit and he received the the um, biometrics appointment but also after that he received um rfe so request for evidence and it says um that they need to let me check they didn't do the biometrics um no, it says, please submit the evidence that you have properly filed from I-589. So it's an asylum case. And uh, this person looks like they need to provide the passport or any ID from their country. Oh, yes. Uh, that happens They don't a have lot. a passport. Right. Because at the, if they come through the border, uh, the border took away the passport, they really have no ID. So sometimes they do want something, but then you need to look at why they need that ID. Sometimes, like if I know Lincoln, Nebraska is faster, I found Lincoln, even though I should have filed in Texas. Because sometimes you just want some sort of ID to prove that you should have filed. Because they are not stupid, right? Because people like us, we are really smart. We know how to play jurisdiction and we shouldn't do that. So, um, so on the other hand, they need some sort of ID uh, because if you come through the border, you have your passport. The passport is the international ID. They took it. They have no ID. So how do I prove you are you? So maybe that's why they need it because they already took the fingerprint. They still need the ID. So you need to read it carefully and just give them, say, uh, the passport is so-and-so is taken away. And here is my picture, and you can go maybe go to an Indian embassy, whatever country you're from, and show that's you. Or go to a library and get a picture ID or something. They just want to prove this person is you. It's not that difficult. We also get those questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Wong. And last question. Um, we have just two more minutes. Can I get a green card if my seven uh, if my I seven thirty approved is approved, but I have an all removal order? Yes, absolutely. 730 approval <clears throat> is very powerful. It means that your spouse or your parent and you're under 21 uh, has already an asylum pending. 730 means that 
one of my parents or spouse have uh, asylum filed mm. and approved. 730 approval after one year, I can file for my green card, but I already had an order of deportation. So you need to use, show them the 730 approval, show them maybe your work permit as an A5, and then uh, do the motion to reopen. But before the motion reopen, because you only get one chance, uh, you may want to do a FOIA. It's an in absentia motion reopen, and make sure on your FOIA on your old because you already had a deportation, which means that you were stopped at the border or you had a job raid or something. Make sure the two thirteen, which states your name and your date of birth, is correct and it's the same as what your parents or your spouse say. Because sometimes. We know all the tricks in the trade because to win asylum you file within one year so a lot of times the parents so for example you're born in 99 the parents would say you're born in 2001 because to make that one year so if they came in 99 if you're born in 99 and they came in 2002 you know so they have to say you're four years so so these are things that it's not just oh 730 approved i do a motion before i get my green card you have to look at the parents' case. You have to look at your own case and check when did the lawyers or notario say you came to America? When did the lawyers and notario say they came to America? And when they came to America, were they married or were you born? Because in some culture, like the Muslim culture, they're not supposed to be sleeping together and have a child. So maybe your parents say there's no child and somebody, how come you got a 730 approval, you know? So these are things that I would recommend you to check. I mean, at least as a lawyer, I check it because I don't want to get yelled at by my client. And also you already have the deportation. So I would double check that. Yeah, this person just added that uh, the spouse sponsor her or him and currently my spouse is reopening um currently uh sponsor reopening is getting an i-485 also penny yeah 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 so base make sure the spouse so make sure what's the date of marriage were you in america at that time or were you overseas and also when were you married because a lot of times so for example i have no papers i met someone also from hong kong or china i'm from hong kong uh, that's filing asylum so i'll marry him or her because the marriage is not to a citizen they normally don't investigate this marriage and then two days later she won and then because I married her before two days, I can get a 730 approval. So you have to make sure even in the trial, in the IH, that she tell the judge, oh, I married two days ago. You see, because if you didn't, then you have to look at the question that they even ask. Because uh, then these are things, the little things as a lawyer we need to do. The 730 is not as simple as you think. Expect also for a spouse. When did he come? When do I come? And stuff like that. Thank you, you so also much. check the 485 because the 485 on the asylum grant is, for example, on the asylum grant, they say, did you go see a medical treatment? The answer is yes. On the asylum grant, they say, did you go report the police? The answer is yes. Were you ever detained by the police? The answer is yes. On my 485, same question, were you ever cited, arrested, pled guilty to, or detained by the police? If you say no, then, but on asylum, you say yes, right? So. So how come on your 45, you said no? Oh, because on asylum grant, on the asylum, I was detained in Mexico. I was not here, but still you were detained because the question did not ask where. The question say, were you ever? But these are little things, so just be careful. Okay, thank you so much. We're getting a lot of messages. Uh, Malak Jadala says, uh, thank you for your efforts to help immigrants in this country. Great job. Thank you so much. We need to dismiss because I feel the pressure. Uh -oh. uh, from uh, your clients waiting for you. So thank you so much, Miss Wong, for thank your you. time. See you next time. And uh, don't forget that you can call the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, attorney Margaret W. Wong, an associate with over 46 years of experience working for the immigrants. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time.